Chapter 31, Unpredictable Happenings. Virgil wasn't home, which means he's in trouble, I know, said Kaori. We need to have the ceremony. After they had returned from Virgil's house, they'd collapsed on the floor of the Kanakas' living room to discuss their next plan of action. They'd also turned on the television, which had lured Jen's attention away. All for the better, as far as Kaori was concerned. Who needs the insight of a child where matters of life and death are at stake? Just Prene frowned at the TV and said, It's hard for me to make out sounds with the TV on in the background. Makes everything garbled. She wiggled her hands around her ears as if this was the universal sign for garbled. Do you mind if we lower it? Kaori glared at her sister. Turn that thing down. Jen muted it, but didn't look away. Did you say something about a ceremony? Brene asked Kaori. Kaori's face turned serious. She straightened her back and folded her hands in her lap. The ceremony of lost things, Kaori said solemnly. It's a ritual to help us find Virgil, but we can't do it here. We have to go into the woods. The ceremony only works if you're one with nature, and this certainly isn't nature, she gestured toward the television. The clock on the wall, a hideously ugly and practical thing in Kaori's opinion, said it was 219. She wondered how long people had to be lost to be considered a missing person. It hadn't been that long, but a lot of bad things could happen in three hours and 19 minutes. Kaori anticipated just Renee's next question. What's the ceremony of lost things? Truth be told, Kaori had no idea. She was sure there was a proper ceremony that could help gifted mediums find lost items or people. She just didn't know what it was. No matter, she would figure it out as she went along. The ancestors would guide her. There's no time to explain all the details, said Kaori. She stood quickly and snapped her fingers in her sister's direction. Jen turned her head, but not her eyes, from the TV. Kaori sighed. Really? Jen was more trouble than she was worth sometimes. Kaori had explained that television was too practical, too traditional, too everyday for the Tanaka daughters. But the poor kid didn't seem to get it. Jen, said Kaori, get mom's secret matches. We're going into the woods. Mrs. Tanaka kept a box of matches in the second drawer under the microwave. She used them to light her secret cigarettes, the ones she thought she was hiding from her daughters, as if. You can't hide anything from me, mother, Kaori had once said. I inherited the second sight. Inherited from who, her mother had asked. No one on either side of the family has ever been remotely interested in such things. Miss Tanaka, Mrs. Tanaka had no appreciation for bloodlines or former lives, the kind that stretched back generations, the ones that no one knew about. When Kaori imagined her birth, she pictured herself emerging from a patch of lavender, dark-haired and full of rage at the injustice of her past lives, of which there were two. The first time she'd walked the earth, she'd been in ancient Egypt. She knew this because it came to her in a dream. She saw herself slipping between the pyramids in a long white robe. What other explanation was there except that she had once walked through the pyramids in real life? In her second life, she was a freedom fighter from Bangladesh. She knew this because she'd once seen a snippet of a documentary on television, and when they showed images of Bangladesh, they really looked familiar to her and she couldn't explain why. She probably could have learned more if her father hadn't switched the channel. She tried to explain that the documentary was necessary for her to explore past life transgressions, but he said it was March Madness and past life transgressions didn't happen during college basketball season. Just because her parents didn't know about her secret heritage and magical and mystical powers didn't make them not so. Besides, her parents had always been monstrously unimaginative. Take the smoking, for instance. Mrs. Tanaka smoked one or two cigarettes a week on the back patio, but she failed to consider that Kaori's bedroom window was usually downwind, which meant the smoke blew right by the spirit chamber. Clueless. Jen didn't make a move for the matches right away. Instead, she took her precious time getting up so she could catch the end of her show. She didn't get a fire under her until Kaori snapped again. Life-saving missions don't wait for commercial breaks, you know, she said. Besides, we need to hurry before Mr. and Mrs. Tanaka get home. Jen was still dragging her feet as Just Renee strode toward the door with her bag slung on her shoulder. 
Kaori snatched one of her mother's decorative candles out of the candlestick on the table, stuck it in her back pocket, and followed just Renee outside. Once the door opened, Jen picked up her pace. She grabbed her jump rope, slung it over her shoulder. Why do you bring that thing everywhere we go? asked Kaori. It's not as if we're going to jump rope through the trees. You never know when you might need a jump rope, said Jen. Kaori rolled her eyes. Really? You're a wonder. She took the matches from her little sister, and the three of them stepped into the blazing hot sun. It's hot, Jen said. We should cook an egg. She'd heard somewhere that it was possible to cook an egg on a car or cement if it was hot enough outside, and she'd been needling Kaori about it ever since. We don't have time for science experiments, said Kaori. She locked the front door and shoved the house key deep into her pocket. Just Renee was already a few feet ahead, making her way toward the street. It only takes two seconds to crack an egg, Jen said. How can you think about eggs at a time like this? Kaori asked. She and Jen followed Just Renee, who stopped at the Tanakis' mailbox to wait. I bet he's okay, said Jen. He probably just forgot. What's the worst thing that could have happened? You don't want me to answer that, Kaori said. Where are we going exactly? asked Just Renee. Yeah, said Jen. Where are we going with the matches and candle exactly? Kaori pointed straight ahead without breaking her stride, like a general leading her troops into battle. That way, she said. As they crossed the street and entered the woods side by side, Jen tugged at Renee's sleeve. Do your hearing aids hurt? she asked. Sometimes they itch or make a dent in my ear. Hurts a little, Renee said. The trees brought much needed shade from the heat. Kaori took note of their sound surroundings, thinking. She wasn't very familiar with the woods. Truth be told, they creeped her out. The woods were full of unpredictable happenings. Snapping creatures, falling branches, stinging insects. She preferred the comforts of home, where she always knew what to expect. But what choice did she have? It's not like they were going to find Virgil hiding under one of the sofa cushions. Why do you still have to read lips if you have hearing aids? asked Jen. Twigs crunched under their feet. They don't make me hear everything clearly, the way you do. I have to fit the sounds with the shape the lips make, like a puzzle, Renee said, looking from Jen to the woods. And then I have to fit the sounds and the shapes with the situation, because so many words look the same when you lip read, like mat and mad or pat and pad. Were you born deaf? No, I could hear a little. That's how I learned to talk, but then it went away, mostly. I wonder if mine will go away. Doubtful. Could you read lips from far away if you had binoculars or a telescope? Kaori couldn't take it anymore. How was she supposed to become one with the forest if Jen kept talking? Stop asking so many questions, Kaori snapped. She heard buzzing near her ear and swatted at it. Jen blinked at her. Why? Because it's rude. Just Renee doesn't mind. Jen looked up at their new client and tapped her hand. Do you? I mind, Kaori said. We need to stay focused, and your prattling isn't helping. Kaori didn't want to admit it, but she liked having Jen as her second in command, which meant she was always first in command, which meant she needed to be in charge. But just Renee seemed to be a natural take-charge person. She was leading the way, even though she had no idea what they were supposed to be looking for. Kaori would bet money she was a Leo. Let's stop here, Kaori said. Jen stopped, then just Renee. They both looked at Kaori curiously. To properly conduct the ceremony, we need a special type of stone, said Kaori with as much authority as she could. Like the five stones you told Virgil to get, Jen asked. What five stones, asked just Renee, looking from little sister to big sister. Kaori ignored the question. There was no time to explain minor details. We only need one. It's called a snakeskin agate. Just Renee tilted her head. Did you say you need a snakeskin agate? Yes, snakeskin agate, Kaori repeated. What's that? asked Jen. It's a stone. It could be as small as a pigeon egg. Kaori opened her empty hand as if the agate would magically appear there. It's a rock with scales. That's why it's called a snakeskin. Just Renee frowned. We'll never find one of those in these woods. How do you know? asked Kaori. There's all kinds of rocks and things in here. Because snakeskin agates are usually found in dry riverbeds or along beaches, places where there's water. 
Just Renee looked around at the dry twigs and towering trees. There definitely isn't any water around here. Jen crossed her arms and raised her eyebrows at Kaori. Now what? Kaori didn't know what to say. For all she knew, just Renee was right. Kaori had never actually seen a snakeskin agate, after all, but she'd studied endless pages of gems online, and she knew which ones were used for what. The snakeskin agate helped you find lost things, and Virgil was lost, if not to himself, then to her. And as silly and ridiculous as Virgil was, she wanted to know he was alive and breathing. I suppose we don't necessarily need to find a snakeskin agate precisely, said Kaori. Maybe just something like it. I mean, it's the gem you're supposed to use, but whatever. I guess we can just get a rock with scales. Something close enough. Maybe our energy will make up for the rest. Jen looked up at just Renee to gauge her reaction. What do you think? she asked. Kaori frowned. She'd never heard Jen ask anyone else for guidance before, not even their parents. Just Renee studied Jen's face, then looked at Kaori. A few seconds passed before she said, If your sister says we need to find a rock with scales, I guess we need to find a rock with scales. Kaori's shoulders relaxed. Something passed between the two older girls then, a mutual understanding that didn't need to be spoken, and Kaori, being a gifted person of second sight, had great appreciation for such things. She smiled at Just Renee, just a little, just a hint, and Just Renee smiled back. That was when they heard the screaming. <laughs>